Um, I, Hare, O oh my Lord, Tava, of your Lordship, Pada Ekamula, whose only shelter is the lotus feet, Dasa Anudasa, the servant of your servant, Bhavitasmi, shall I become Buya again, Mar, my mind, Smareta, may remember Asupate of the Lord of my life, Gunan, the attributes, Te. Of your lordship, Grinita, may chant, Vak, my words, Karma, activities of service to you, Kurotu, may perform, Kayaha, my body. This verse is actually a fundamental verse in the whole Bhagavatam. It's one of them outstanding verses and you can you'll understand it by the Prabhupada's purport O oh my Lord O oh Supreme Personality of Godhead will I again be able to be the servant of your eternal servants who find shelter only at your lotus feet O oh Lord of my life may I again become their servant so that my mind may always think of your transcendental attributes my words always glorify those attributes and my body always engage in the loving service of your Lordship. Please repeat, O oh my Lord, O oh Supreme Personality of Godhead, will I, be, will I again be able to be the servant of your eternal servants who find shelter only at your lotus feet? O oh Lord of my life, may I give be again become their servant, so that my mind may always think of your transcendental attributes. My words always glorify those attributes, and my body always engage in the loving service of your Lordship. Srila Prabhupada's purport. This verse gives the sum and substance of devotional service. One must first become a servant of the servant of the servant of the Lord. Dasa Anudasa. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu advised and also showed by his own example that a living entity should always desire to be the servant of the servant of the servant of Krishna the maintainer of the gopis, Gopi Bhartu Padakamalayor, Dasa Dasa Anudas. This means that one must accept a spiritual master who comes in a disciplic succession and is an eternal servant of the servant of the Lord. Under his direction, one must then engage one's three propensities, namely his body, mind, and words. The body should be engaged in physical activity under the order of the spiritual master. The mind should think of Krishna incessantly, and one's words should be engaged in preaching the glories of the Lord. If one is thus engaged in loving service of the Lord, one's life is successful. Om Ajnan Timidam Dasya Jena Salakaya, Chaksu Undalitam Yena, Tasmai Shri Gurvena Maha, Shri Chaitanya Manobi Stam Stap Ditam Yena Bhutale, Swayam Rupa Kadam Mayam Tadati Swa Padanti Kam, Bande Hum, Shigoro, Shiuta Padekamalam, Shigurun Vaishnavam Scha, Shi Rupam Sa Gujatam Sahagana, Ragada Tam Vitam Tam Sajivam. Sadvaitam Sarvadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitamscha 
Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namine Namaste Sarasati Deve Gorvani Pacharine Nirvisesa Sunyavari Pastyatya Daisatarine Pancha Kalpa Thuru Vizja Kripa Sindhu Pae Baja Patitanam Pabane Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Namahona Maha Jai Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nitananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Vindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare mm. Mm. It's interesting this verse has been something that I've been reading every day and it just happens to come up today and it's, it's an interesting verse <coughs> because it actually as Prabhupada um, begins the purport he says this is the sum and substance of devotional service to become the servant of the supreme personality of Godhead means to one to regain one's natural position all living entities jivar sarupai are eternally the servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So that is our constitutional position. The living entity cannot be anything else but its own natural nature. As a water, water can only be wet, uh, fire can only be hot, sugar can only be sweet, chili can only be pungent. So the living entity's nature is to love and serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Anything other than that is foreign to one's nature and contrary to the nature also, which causes one to suffer or to struggle unnecessarily. So coming back to our position, here's the means to come back. So one might think, oh, let me serve the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But one cannot approach the Lord in the conditioned state that one is in. In other words, one has to apply the principles on how, again, to regain that natural state of relationship with the Lord. In other words, one cannot just automatically serve the Lord. One has to serve the Lord by serving the Lord's servant. And this is the only means by which one can approach the Lord. So to serve the Lord directly is natural because that is our nature. But because of our conditioned state, we don't really know how to serve the Lord or what is the mood by which that service should be executed. And so knowledge and practical guidance is fundamental to regaining that natural constitutional position. Without that, then one will speculate. Sometimes we hear people say, oh, I serve the Lord. Well, what do you do? Well, I give a donation. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> or I come to the temple and I offer some respects. But what is the main, what is, it, what is your mood? Why are you doing that? What is the motivation? So services to the Lord is something that is, because it's natural, it is not um, mixed with anything else. As Krishna says, or actually the Bhagavatam explains, Savai pum sam paro dharmo, yato bhakti ahoksaje, ahoy chuki apriyata, yatma suprasidati. That actual devotional service has to have these two qualities. Otherwise, it's mixed devotional service and mixed devotional service doesn't satisfy the soul, nor does it give complete uh, connection to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And what are those two qualities? It has to be free from any personal motivation, and it has to be continuous. In other words, there should be no break. So these are the two things, a hoi to ki, without any motivation, a priyata, continuously. That is really devotional service. So Rupa Goswami explains what is not devotional service in one verse where he gives both principles. 
Aya Vilasita Sunya, Gyana Karma Anavritam, Anukulena Krishna Silam, Bhakti Uttamam. He says it has to be free from any desires to gain anything by the process of execution devotional service. Gaining anything material. What are some of the material things? Dhanam, Janam, what is the other one? Yasoda, Jasoda. Jasoda means I want to be famous. Dhanam means I want wealth. Janam means I want followers. Sundarim, I want to be appreciated as a great scholar of the Vedas. What, are the, what else Sundar is? I want appreciation by the opposite sex. In other words, these more subtle forms of material uh, contaminations block the real principle of pure devotional service. So devotional service is a, it takes, it's not, a, it's not something that comes automatically. That's why Prabhupada would use the word cultivate. And when you have a garden and you want to make, say you have a piece of land that is fertile for a garden, you have to work at it. You know, you have to dig up the land, get rid of some of the roots, and then make the land fertile enough so you can plant nice trees and shrubbery, flowers, and so many other things, maybe make pathways, put a fence around it so it's protected, um, and do many, many things so it's a process to bring the garden about. So in the same way, devotional service is a constant practice to bring about the consciousness of I'm becoming the servant of the Lord. So sometimes when we hear, well, nothing's, there's nothing in it for me. I don't get anything. I can't be, I can't have any, any other consideration. Yeah, that's true. Y you can't. <laughs> because what Krishna is offering you is something that you can, that is comp compared to what is this world can offer. What can this world offer as a benediction? All it can do is stabilize you in such a way that in somehow or other you can live a certain amount of years. In other words, it can give you a nice jail cell. So you go to jail, we preach in jail, and we find that there's three types of prisoners. One is called the privileged prisoner. He's been a good prisoner, been there for some time, knows the area, gets along with other prisoners, very obedient to his uh, superiors, doesn't cause any trouble, yeah, always on time for whatever he's responsible for. So he's given a little bit of extra freedom. I used to go to prisons and I would see these uh, inmates who would be there and they'd have keys to unlock certain doors so people could go in and out and they would also have access to the, to the library and other places. Where other prisoners, they would be just the mainstream and they would be following the rules and regulations and they would be the large majority. And then there was those who were, you know, disobedient and causing trouble, and they were put into what is called solitary confinement, where they would have to have no other association in a small little tiny room. Their food would be handed underneath the door. They wouldn't even even see the person giving the food. There would be one little steel bed with no mattress and no pillow, steel, and one small toilet, that's all in a little room which is a maybe six feet by six feet. <laughs> so that's called solitary confinement and they're there for a limited time as a punishment. So you can look at these things as the three modes of material nature, rajas, ta tamas, and sattvas. So we might say, oh, look at that prisoner who is, uh, you know, he's a He's a pretty good prisoner. He can walk around. He can unlock doors. You know, even the, the guards somehow have a nice relationship with him. But he's still in jail. That's the problem. <laughs> he's still in jail. And then you look at the other <laughs> categories of inmates. They're in a lesser position. So this is like being controlled by the different modes of material nature. 
So even the best material situation is another form of confinement. That's all. This is the nature of this material world. Okay, locked up by material desires. And what is the strongest material desire in this world? Sex life. That's why this world is called Maitunya Agra, the shackles of sex life. The attachment to enjoy the facilities of sensual pleasures with the opposite sex. So these are these these are shackles that lock one. So if one has any desire to find happiness in any of these activities in the material world, one will have to take birth again in this material world. Well, you might say, well, you know, I'll get a good birth. I was a devotee, you know. Yeah, but still, taking birth is not an easy thing. Even coming into a good material position means you still have to come back into a situation where you still have to fight that material desire that caused you to take birth in the previous in this life. It's not like, oh, all right, so I didn't make it completely. I can come back and you know, I'll, you know, I'll be a devotee again. But still, material desires are there. So therefore. This verse gives the way out of everything, as Prabhupada said, the sum and substance. To find shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord by finding shelter at the lotus feet of the Lord's pure devotee. What does it mean to take shelter of the Lord's pure devotee? It means to follow strictly the instructions of the spiritual master. Yasya Devi para bhaktir gita Devi tata guru Tasyaita kartita yata prakasamatna mahatmanaha. One who has implicit faith, the word implicit means not moved by any situation, when that faith can never be broken by anything. Just like we have an example that it's the duty of the spiritual master to test the disciple, to see how sincere the disciple is. These tests really are actually benedictions for the disciple to show the sincerity and the surrender of the s disciple. So the spiritual master has to test. I was just with, I was just recently in London. I was just staying at one very wonderful house. And the lady was telling me, she said, my spiritual master told me when I was a young girl, he said, move into the ashram and stay there for two years. And then, if you can do that, I'll give you initiation. <laughs> now, she's never had ashram life, always had a pretty good situation. The material world came from a good family. But she said, after she was telling me, she said, I was glad I did it. I was glad I did it because it really helped me understand deeper what it means to be a disciple. It really helped me do it. And I learned so much in that environment, although it was difficult for me because I was not accustomed to have that kind of, you know, living condition. I was always a grown up in a nice family and I had good parents, wealth was there, you know, facilities were there. Now having to sleep on the floor, living in an ashram where it's cold sometimes, you know, so many different but that was, she said, I was glad he gave me that test. But when he gave it to me, I wasn't glad. <laughs> I wasn't glad. So therefore, the spiritual master does that in order just to bring out the, 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 the good qualities of a disciple. Because if everything is easy in Krishna consciousness, which is not because we still have to deal with our mind, but Krishna, through the spiritual master, gives us some opportunities to surrender. And these opportunities to surrender are actually great m merciful uh, facilities in order to bring out the good qualities of a devotee. It says if you want to make a diamond and you have a piece of coal, because you coal come, diamonds come from coal, but coal, you know, it doesn't look like a diamond and doesn't act like a diamond, has none of the qualities of a diamond. But if you put it under pressure for a thousand years, 
if it stays in in a very pressure it, it actually changes its nature and becomes a diamond so it's good to get a little pressure yeah it's nice to get a little difficulties sometimes we we try to avoid difficult let me find the easy way in krishna consciousness but there is no easy way because this material world is constituted in such a way that wherever way you go you have difficulties just the way it is so why not accept those difficulties that will purify our heart and bring us to a great higher stage of surrender and devotion to the supreme lord and therefore Therefore, following the instructions of the spiritual master may, means making those instructions one's only focus in life, nothing else. When one has that, what we say, desire, we call it sankalpa. The sankalpa means I will do it. So uh, kalpa, me, uh, uh, another way to look at it is I'll do it if it's convenient, or if it's easy, it's according to uh, whether it fits into my uh, repertoire of you know time. But a song kalpa means it doesn't matter. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I mean, look what Prabhupada had to do to, to spread Krishna consciousness. Any 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 thousand persons in the same situation would have turned back. I mean, he had so many difficulties extreme difficulties but it was the order of the spiritual master spread Krishna consciousness in the western world at the age of 70 where health was failing no facilities no support foreign country no money nothing no place to live even heart at three two heart attacks coming on the boat Prabhupada never gave up so you, we might say, well, I'm not like Prabhupada, but he's teaching us what is devotional service. To be ready to accept hardships in order to follow the instructions of the spiritual master. That's why one should approach the spiritual master and say, Jai Sisi Panchitattva Ki Jai. One should approach the spiritual master and say, how can I serve you not like uh, well you know what do you got for me and let me see if I like it or not <laughs> how can I serve you and the more difficult the service the greater the happiness does that make sense <laughs> yeah because these things are purifying they purify the heart but the spiritual master, Prabhupada, would say, Krishna will not test you beyond your ability to pass. It's not that he will break the devotee by giving them something impossible, but it may sometimes be seen like that or experienced like that. Like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told one of his brahmachari disciple, who was a dutiful brahmachari, never did anything wrong. He was serving the Lord. He told him, get married. He didn't want to get married. Not that he didn't, he didn't have any aversion to the Grihastha ashram, but he knew by getting married I would lose the association of Lord Chaitanya, which was my life and soul. He was, he was his personal servant when they were traveling. But he did it, and the Lord told him, You'll never lose my association, I promise you. <laughs> and the Lord came to him in the form of a beautiful deity. And he worshipped that deity as, uh, as he was worshipping and serving Lord Chaitanya personally. So this verse is nice. But then again, there's another indication here. Just to become the servant of the spiritual master and not to see how the spiritual master's instructions are understood in a broader sense. And that means if you want to become my servant, you have to become the servants of the servants of all the other servants. <laughs> so, because there is a different levels of bhakti, and there is devotees who think, oh, 
I'll serve the Lord. I'll serve my spiritual master. But the other devotees, I don't have any time. Uh, you know, they're not, you know, I'm not attracted to serving them. But this verse says, Das, Das, Anudas. And Prabhupada gives an interesting point. He says to become servant of the servant of the servant of the servant 100 times removed. So the more we can practice this mood of servant, the more we can understand our relationship with Krishna. Like that. Just like when Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was asked, Guru Maharaj, how many, mm, how many disciples do you have? He said, I have four, two arms and two legs. They carry out my instructions. <laughs> In other words, he was making the point, and he also expounded on that point by saying, when some, he said, anyone who thinks he's a guru is a guru. Guru. Guru means cow. <laughs> what, he probably, what he's saying is an animal. If one identifies with anything else than the position of servant, that is called a hankara, or false identity. Oh, I'm a preacher, I'm a temple president, I'm a mataji, I'm a prabhu. <laughs> I'm g give a nice list of whatever you can come up with, but you only have one identity. We only have one identity, das, das, anudas, that's our only identity. And all these other roles we play are simply what they are. They're roles, that's all. Hmm. If we become attached to the roles and think that the role is me, and by executing the role perfectly, th that will be my success. No. The actual success is to have that consciousness das, das, anu das. And be exemplary, or try to be exemplary in the way that you are supposed to serve. And that is, of course, pleasing to the spiritual master. But this point, this verse is very, very, so this, this, this verse is not just a statement, it's a prayer. Will I again be the servant of your eternal servants who find shelter only at your, only, only, only at your lotus feet? In other words, praying to be re regain our natural constitutional position. So how is that? How is that played out by always being in the mood of servant? There are two moods: the mood of enjoyment and the mood of service. Sometimes they get mixed up. <laughs> service is enjoyable. Why? Because it's nature. That's our nature. To our nature is to enjoy. Our nature is to serve. By serving, we actually find happiness through service. But if we put the enjoyment mood ahead of the service mood, or mix it in with the service mood equally, then we actually miss the understanding. So it's not like, well, I'll serve if I can be happy. But if I'm not going to be happy, it was going to be cause me some difficulty. Maybe I'll do something else. I won't serve. Mm -hmm. So we should be attached to service and not be attached to the idea of how I should serve. Of course, we have our propensities, and that's given to us and by our spiritual master and by the directions of the spiritual master coming through the temple authorities. <coughs> who are representatives of the Lord. We should also see that, that those who are in a position to manage my life as being my, what we say, immediate superiors, they are representatives of my spiritual master. If you don't see them like that, then you see them as something else, then you are missing the point because the spiritual master works through his representatives who are your shelter in the immediate day-to-day -day life. So to ob obey the instructions of the superiors within the society means to obey the instructions of the spiritual master. Does that make sense? 
there's a few heads not moving in their, in their other way. Well, does that mean my temple present and my authorities are perfect? They're in the perfect position. Even if they make the mistake, it doesn't matter. Because the principle is obedience and not so per so much perfection. Perfection comes through the princ principle of surrender and service. And by doing that, one will actually come to perfection. Even if there's something less than perfection in the authority that is ruling me. Because that's the principle of surrender. That makes sense. Yes. No. No comment. It's okay. Questions? Yeah, questions. Could you uh, could you repeat these two sentences? Repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. Those who are in a position to govern our lives as managers or counselors or t temple authorities, they are representatives of our spiritual master. So by following their instructions, you're following the instructions of the spiritual master. Even if apparently, from your point of view, or even if it's obvious that they, there is some mistake on their part, still, if you follow their instructions, get clarification on the, on the point, and follow their instructions, you're still in the perfect situation. Otherwise, what is the meaning of authority? If authority has no authority, then what is the meaning of authority? If the authority is subject to what we say, to being rejected because I don't like it, then there's no authority there. We can question authority, that's, that's there. You can question authority, but questioning and clarification ultimately leads to eventually surrender. Surrender has to be there. Otherwise, mm, that facility to question gives us a greater understanding of what is the instructions, of why I should carry out the instructions. So these principles are foundational in keeping our relationship with the spiritual master. Yes. Does that help? Mm -hmm. Krishna, I have a question here. What to, to do then when, uh, if you think that um, you could do better, um, like if authority says something to you, how to do it? But you think then that just you make your point. Make your point. But you can't. You can't be in a challenging mood. Then what is the question of authority? You have to say, oh, I think it will work better this way. What do you think? And then if they agree with you, fine. If they don't agree with you, then you have to surrender to whatever they say. It's not that we shut down communication. It's not like it's like Nazi Germany where you just, you just do it without any question. No, it's you can question, but ultimately you have to surrender after you give your questions. Mm -hmm. what is, is that all right? What, are all, what, is, what is authority and has no value if you can't uh, surrender to authority? <laughs> Everyone's under an authority anyway. Even those who, who reject all forms of authority, they have to listen to their mind, which is another authority. And that authority will get you in trouble sometimes, a lot of times. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Maharaj, for your class. <coughs> I have some question about these, mm. these two points mm. in connection with the pure devotional service about con continuously and unmotivated. Um, without any motivation. About this, this special point without motivation. Mm. What what means without motivation? Because I sometimes I think I wanna be happy. I wanna be pure. I wanna be. I wanna be. I wanna be. Well, 
There is spiritual motivations which are not contrary to the principle, and that is, I want to please Krishna. I want to purify my heart so I can be eligible to go back home, back to Godhead. But if I want to be happy, that's still a little bit of tinge on a personal level. Because happiness comes by the process and not desiring it. If you desire to be happy, then you have some way to figure out how you're going to be happy. Oh, I'll be happy. I'll just come to kirtans because I like kirtans, but I won't do anything else because I'm that makes me happy. <laughs> and then, then anyway, then your 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 consciousness is to pick and choose what you think is best for you. You have to take the package completely. That's why Prabhupada said, chanting Hare Krishna is the essence of spiritual practice, but if you don't follow the other rules and regulations, your chanting will never develop. He calls it cooking with smoke. And he says if you're chanting, but you're not following the other pr principles, you're cooking with smoke. And then he says, it'll take you 300 years to get breakfast. <laughs> So <laughs> the point is that all these other rules and regulations support the uh, the higher principles of hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord. So, you know. And if you're not sure exactly which ones to follow or how to follow them, I mean, everything's there in the Nectar Devotion. If we read the Nectar Devotion, we understand the whole science of bhakti. It's explained in detail. Prabhupada took Rupa Goswami's sta uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and broke it down and gave him very clear explanations to some of the hard verses that were there. Prabhupada said, Nectar devotion, read it once, read it twice, read it thrice. He said, this book should be your, your guidebook on how to execute devotional service. So we should understand what is that science of bhakti and how to execute it. And part of that is what to avoid. This is where I see devotees have a problem. They know what to do, but they don't know what not to do. <laughs> and by doing what's not, mm, mm, just be, it's not because they are try they're not trying to do it, the right thing. It's just they're not aware of the, the things to avoid which causes one to lose the benefit of gain, what you gain from doing the right thing. You water down your... So therefore, mm, bhakti is made up of two things, do's and don'ts. It's called vidis and nishedas. Mm -hmm. Vidis means things to do, and nishedas means things to avoid. <coughs> and then nectar devotion has 64 rules and regulations in one of the chapters, and... Uh, I think 39 of them are rule are thi are do's and the other the remaining ones are don't are don'ts. So a lot there's a lot of don'ts there. <laughs> like sitting in the temple. If you sit in the temple like this, that's an offense. You can't sit like that before the deities. That's what it says in nectar devotion. If you have your arms like this, in front of the deities, that's an offense. If you put your feet towards the deities, that's an offense. If you put your feet towards the devotees, that's an offense. If you're walking through a crowd and you step over someone, that's an offense. N when you're walking through a tight crowd, like our kirtan program, you have to tell the devotees, I'm coming. You just you see, if you step over someone, you're stepping over a spirit soul, and that's an offense because the spirit soul is throughout the whole body. There's a lot of rules and regulations that because we're not aware of all these things, we're chanting, we're dancing, we're reading, we're serving, but we're adding all these th wrong things and we're just watering down our, our spiritual progress. Like that. So mm, wanting to be happy is is natural because the whole principle of life is to be happy. Sometimes we say that 
what is the goal of life? The goal of life is to be happy. But then, what is happiness and how to get it? But if, but Prahlad Maharaj, he speaks. He says, if you want to do, if you want to be happy, do one thing. Don't try for it. That's Prahlad Maharaj. He says, if you want to be happy, don't try to be happy, because you know you are, your conception of how to be happy is not going to work. If you think I'm going to be happy by doing devotional service, that's nice, but it's not pure, because we want to make Krishna happy. As Prabhupada would s make the comparison between religious traditions, he, he says one one tradition says, "My dear Lord, give me my daily bread." Right? One prayer they make, "Please, Lord, give me my daily bread." But we say, "My dear Lord, what would you like to eat?" <laughs> so there's a difference. <laughs> now Krishna is not going to make you starve. <laughs> There's never devotees don't starve. <laughs> In fact, they have more than they can handle. The idea is put when you put service to Krishna, service to the spiritual master, and service to the devotees. Foremost, everything you're looking for in life automatically comes by that mood. You don't have to try for things separately. There's a beautiful verse in the third canto of the Srimad Bhagavatam. Chapter 22. I can't think of the actual verse. Uh, Prabhupada says, just, just try to serve Krishna and please Krishna and everything in your life that you ever want will come automatically by the power of devotional service. So that's the point. That's the point. If you want to nourish the body, you can't think, oh, my back hurts. I'll put some food on my back. <laughs> no, you have to put the food in the stomach, and then the energy will be transformed and transmitted, and every all the parts of the body will get the benefit of the eating. So by serving the Lord, everything, everything else becomes, what we say, fulfilled, wonderful, automatically. Is that okay? Yeah. And that takes some sacrifice, yes? Hare Krishna Maharaj. So h how can we know if our service is pleasing Krishna? Because sometimes we feel like, oh, I'm service, but we are not still feeling this. Mm. Uh, that w mm -hmm. The question is, how, how do we know our service is pleasing the Lord? Prabhupada was asked that question, and I remember his answer. He says, because you're connected to Krishna, if Krishna's pleased, you're pleased. <laughs> if you're feeling satisfied in your service, that means Krishna's pleased. But sometimes you can ask your spiritual master, or you can ask the temple representatives, am I pleasing Krishna? <laughs> and get some feedback on that way. But Prabhupada made that point because we're never separated from Krishna. When we please Krishna, automatically we can experience uh, the happiness that he's reciprocating because he reciprocates when we please him immediately. Any other questions? Okay, this is a very wonderful verse. Let's read it again together. O oh my Lord, O oh 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 Supreme Personality of Godhead, will I again be able to be your servant of your eternal servants who find shelter only at your lotus feet? O oh Lord of my life, may I again become their servant so that my mind may always think of your transcendental attributes. My words always glorify those, tr those attributes. And my body always engage in the loving service of your Lordship. 
So here's the point. By becoming servant of the servant of the servant, then we develop a taste to glorify the Lord and to hear about the Lord and to serve the Lord. The taste comes automatically. Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam ki jai. Srila Prabhupada ki jai.